gang. Blouses. Gallon Chuck. Disaster. I forget the Disaster. Well, I mean, I'm no doctor. We now join America's most popular show already in progress. Everybody loves Mitch and Sean. You guys are the greatest duo. Fantastic. That team sure did suck last night. They just played sucked. I've seen teams suck before, but they were the suckiest bunch of sucks that ever sucked. Welcome in to the Post Game Pints Podcast, Episode 5. I'm Sean Campbell alongside Mitch Gallo. Another episode brought to you by LaBrosse Brewery. Uh, so thankful that they're on board on the Post Game Pints Podcast. By the way, we've been teasing it. We got some surprises coming for you very soon. An association with the Post Game Pints Podcast and LaBrosse Brewery. You can only imagine what Mitch and I are starting to think of. So, well, let's get right into it, Mitch. You ready for the rapid fire? Let's do it. Oh, wait. What is that jersey? We did jerseys last episode, but you did say you were going to pull it out. Oh, that's a thing of beauty. Well, Sean, um, you know I'm not a huge jersey guy. I only have a select few jerseys. Uh, but uh, this one, it's a beauty. Um, let's see. We get the number in there. Is it reverse because yeah. of the camera? Can you see the no. number? 21, baby. 21. So maybe uh, that uh, we can find a way to uh, incorporate it if you could tell me who was uh, 21 on the back of my jersey. Well, by the way, if you go, and I never told you in episode who I was wearing. I just said what number I was wearing for my all-star jersey. If you go to LaBrosse Brewery and you walk in and you tell them what number jersey I was wearing – if you say the name on the back, which I never said last episode, but you knew already because he's one of my favorite players of all time. He never wears number 12, but for some reason at that all-star game, he was wearing number 12. You walk into LaBrosse Brewery and you go check out episode four and you tell them what number jersey I was wearing, you get a discount on your beer just like that. Boom. Boom. Love it. All right, let's go into the rapid fire, Mitch, here on the Post Game Pines podcast. Yeah, buddy. Let's get political. U.S. election, transfer of power right now is not happening. Usually it's pretty seamless, not going to happen. Is the U.S. election, the results from Trump to Biden, could that affect professional sports? I, I, I don't think so. I think if you look at uh, what's going to happen, Biden is certainly going to impl- implement some type of more strict lockdowns. I think it'd be pretty naive to think that nothing is going to change. But I think if you look at uh, sports as a whole, I don't think they're going to be impacted all that greatly. Now, again, there's a lot of things I'm not aware about. And there's a lot of things I'm not even educated enough to talk about. But as far as I'm aware... Um, most of the policies are run uh, through the states anyways, and they're not done nationally. Through the through city, the through, the county, through the counties, through the cities. It's like here in Canada. It's provincial. It's city-wise. We are getting regulations from the city of Montreal, provincially, federally. Everybody kind of has their little domain. And, and the coronavirus, the U.S. is so large and Canada is so, so large, you can't just do a blanket coverage of it, Mitch. You really can't. So, you know, could, could, uh, could something happen where NFL stadiums have a hard time in some states that are currently allowing fans? Maybe. But as far as sports as a whole, I don't think it has all that big an impact. You know, I, I wonder about the border situation and maybe with Biden, if that can actually resolve itself a little bit quicker with Biden compared to Trump. Um, that, that's something to look to, towards, but really, I, I think sports, it's such big business that regardless of who's in power, they would be, 
not too bright to to force too many restrictions on such a big big business as far as money you said it right there to me it's the border the border is the biggest thing and i know that they're delaying it now to the end of december and that's more on the canadian side the u.s is like open everything up but if biden was in control or had his say he might be on par and they might have a schedule of oh maybe we'll be able to integrate like you said it may work better with biden where trudeau and biden could say look We'll allow this, but we won't allow this. It seems like there's no conversation. Canada is just saying, borders closed, you can't go, done, it's over. Whereas I think that there might be more discussion with the Joe Biden. And other than that, I think you're right with the state regulations and the county regulations that people might do their own thing. We've seen it in Montreal. You, you kind of have your region zone red, zone orange, zone yellow, and, and that's the way it's going to work. But uh, I, I, I am curious if it takes longer and then if. Biden comes in power and he has this national plan to do something about the coronavirus and some sort of lockdown, that might hurt uh, fans being in the stands. And I worry about the NHL there because their goal is to get fans sooner than later because the money part of it. Other than that, I think some of the other sports are just going to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah, and the other thing, you know, he, he's, he's going to come in at a really good time probably in January. Uh, Joe Biden, um, based on where it seems – the uh, the vaccines are headed because obviously there's a lot of momentum that looked like around January um, they can start implementing uh, vaccine plans. The other thing is, um, and I think this is a big time player when it comes to having fans in the seats and something to look forward to. How good is the technology going to be at that time when it comes to rapid testing? I think yeah. rapid testing could could really get fans back in the buildings maybe quicker than we think is possible all right so from political why don't we just go into the nfl it's a very simple question mitch and i'm curious if we're gonna sorry i just had to put that there thank you labros uh i just had to, i had to put it there i maybe we have the same answer and we don't like having the same answer for anything that we ask on the post game pines podcast but it's when you're sitting around you're asking and you just throw it out there. Who's the best team in the NFL right now? Do we have the same answer? I don't know if we have the same answer, but a wise man once said, to be the man, you have to beat the man. Woo! And, Sean, that man is the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. The Kansas City Chiefs with only one loss on the season. They are the defending Super Bowl champions. So – to not declare them the best team in the NFL right now, uh, you have a hard argument to make because that is the team that won it all a year ago. All right. So I'm coming in close because I know that YouTubers, and I know that we're on SoundCloud iTunes, did not see what I was doing while you were talking about the Chiefs. And that's what you get on YouTube when you check it out on YouTube. You could subscribe to us at Post Game Pints Podcasts on YouTube. Now, you know I'm biased. And then they're 7-2. But we're not disagreeing. You're right. Ric Flair knows. To be the man, you have to beat the man. And it is the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't care that the Steelers are perfect. I don't care that I love the Green Bay Packers. I will take a Kansas City Green Bay Packers Super Bowl. Absolutely. Even if it's three weeks delayed because of the coronavirus in an empty stadium. I don't care what it is. But the Chiefs are the best team in the NFL. I, I don't even think it's close. And I know records here and there, I don't even think it's close. They could lose two more games in a row, and I will still say the Chiefs, Mitch. Still say the Chiefs. I like their defense. I like their offense. And I, I love Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, and I think they're well coached. Uh, I, I don't see many holes in, in the Kansas City Chiefs. But what about them in the NFC? Who is the best team in the NFC? Who is most likely to play against the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl? Is it the Packers? Yeah, it is. I think it is. Look, they got some problems like everybody Look, I, else. I think, the, I think the, the, run the, defense is a big-time problem for the Packers. Yeah, okay, but they still have a quarterback. If he has the ball at the end of the game within seven points, he's going to be fine. Within eight points, he's going to be fine because I trust him on a two-point conversion. Look, they're getting Alan Lazard back. That is huge. Their schedule's not tough the rest of the way. They're going to be able to ease, I think, into the playoffs because of the, the, the lead that they have. 
Key here is if they can get the number one seed, there is only one buy. And I think that buy is going to be very important in the NFC. If the Saints get it, if the Bucks get it, I think the NFC West is going to keep the records down a little bit. So it won't be Seattle, Arizona, or the Rams. They're going to kind of battle each other. And it's going to be a lot of fun to watch that. But I do think that the Packers, if they get that number one seed, you're not going to want to deal with them. Yes, they have problems defensively. But if the Smith brothers start getting uh, an idea of what they want to do, they can get Kenny Clark in there to stop the run. It may be able to slow things down, but they're built around their offense. They're built around Aaron Rodgers. They're built around Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams. I do think the Packers are the team in the NFC because everything, yeah, they have problems, but the Bucs have problems. The Saints have problems. The Seahawks have problems. Um, and let's not go to the NFC East. Well, look, you mentioned a lot of teams there. I'll tell you this. I think Tampa Bay is a better team than Green Bay, but Green Bay has the better player in Rodgers over Brady right now. Okay, Tampa let's, Bay, let me just jump in with Tampa Bay because I know that Tampa Bay handed Packers one of their two losses. What happens? The Bucs are going to face the Packers again, possibly in the playoffs, and the Bucs are going to try and do the same thing that they did. The Packers will adjust. Matt LaFleur is too smart for that not to adjust. We'll see. Can they stop Ronald Jones? Can they stop Fournette? And, you know, I think maybe Bucks a little bit better on defense than the Packers. But you, you're right. They have the playmaker in, uh, in Rodgers. And, Sean, you might, think, you might think I'm crazy. You might think I'm crazy for this. But I just – I got the, this feeling about the Rams. No one's talking about the Rams. And I think uh, they that, by that, far – that defense is fun, man. That's 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 a fun defense. They have by far the best defense. You look so – all right, if the Rams – let's say the Rams play against the Green Bay Packers, Jalen Ramsey is going to neutralize Devontae Adams. So you could take Devontae – like, did you see what Ramsey was able to do against DK Metcalf? And I know, I know Metcalf is a different type of receiver, but I have confidence in Jalen Ramsey against pretty much – anybody okay here's the thing i agree with you but Jalen ramsey will still need help if they go one-on-one -on -one, he's gonna have his problems Devonte adams one-on-one -on -one is because aaron Rodgers is able to get that extra little time any db can cover a guy for a couple of seconds but aaron Rodgers is so good of getting that extra one to two seconds in the, in the pocket from rolling right and rolling left because their offensive line is designed that way if he gets an extra second or two if it's one-on-one, -on -one, even Jalen Ramsey can't deal with Devontae Adams because it's just too long to cover a guy. They're going to have to double him up. But that's when, ideally, Alan Lazard's going to come in and be healthy. If he's healthy, he's a good-handed receiver. I have no faith in Mark Wentz, Valdez, Scantling. I know he had that huge game against Jacksonville. I still don't have faith against that guy. But it's – the, the, the difference there is the quarterback, if you understand, not the one-on-one. Yeah, yeah. okay, agree with you. Okay. The difference there is the quarterback, but then how do you deal with the elite pass rush of the Rams? Well, that's why you have to design the right plays, and I think that Matt LaFleur has designed that properly where he gets the extra seconds with Aaron Rodgers. And, mm -hmm. and you know I say seconds, but for Aaron Rodgers, because he's so elite, it's half a second. Yeah, remember, remember I, this. I, I would love – by the way, I would love I, – I hope that's the NFC Championship game. I really do. I think that would be and, – and the matchup, you'd be able to dive into it. And it'd be so much fun to watch. I think a lot of people are sleeping on the Rams. Just remember this podcast because everyone talks about all these teams uh, contending. No one talks about the Rams. When I think, I mean, you, you talked about LaFleur there a couple times. I think Sean yeah. McVay is a brilliant <laughs> football mind. I, I agree. I'm not disagreeing with that. I, and that's why I think it'd be fun to watch those two go at it. I really do. Uh, all right, Sean, very quickly, we wrap up rapid fire with James Harden, who has turned down $103 million to stay in Houston. I kind of threw this around, you know, just as we both work in radio. Like, what, what would it take for you to decline $50 million a year? For James Harden, it's playing in Houston. And I understand he's going to get money in the future, and he has money in the past. So it's a different question to ask you or I. But $50 million a year? Man, these NBA players, I think, and I don't know where it's going, and I don't like they, like they like their drafts, they like their super teams, but the NBA is quickly turning into European soccer where you can just buy players. And I know you have to trade players, and, and, and there's still that 
North American mindset about trading, drafting, and contracts moving forward. But I think the NBA is not too far off from, hey, we're just going to buy this player. I'm going to buy that player. He's coming out of college. I'm just going to sign him. There's going to be no draft. I think they're going to get rid of it. I, 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 and maybe it's a decade away. But the NBA is almost there where these, the players are in more control than general managers. James Harden is telling the general manager of the Houston Rockets and the general manager of the Brooklyn Nets to make a deal. Even if both teams don't want to, he's like, make a deal. This is what's happening. That's a lot of power. Hey, man, I agree with everything you just said. The only thing I'll add is I'll, I'll – Write that down. Gallo agrees with everything Campbell says. Title of the podcast. Not says. Just said. But anyways, I look at it like this. I try to put myself in the, in the shoes of the player. Obviously, I'm going to assume James Harden has much bigger shoes than I have. But if I was somewhere – and I was with, let, let, let's say I was with um, Jay Farrar. And then you and Dave Fredua were somewhere else. Oh, I, would I, try to, I, had, I had better company. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I would, but here's the thing. I would try to join you and Dave. So if I was in Houston with Jay and you're in Brooklyn with Dave, I'm doing everything I can. In fact, Sean, I might even decline $103 million to get there with you guys. Farrar is bad company, noted for podcast titles. I like your analogy, by the way. I like your of analogy. Of course you do. What's up, Dave? Dave's not here, man. Uh, all right, we've already done that one. All right, uh, that is our rapid fire. And by the way, the Post Game Pints podcast, Campbell and Gallo, that is brought to you by LeBlanc. Blah, 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 blah. LeBlanc. LeBras. <laughs> Uh, brewery check it out i'm drinking the uh blonde james blonde uh, i don't know if you've tried this one mitch but this yeah. this this is something special uh you can pick it up at 133 labrosse in point player check labrosse.com for their hours look we know that we're all dealing with the coronavirus but you if you want to drink at home and you want to have a couple pints on the side check them out go pick it up go get a quick four pack get eight and it has any kind of flavor anything you want IPA, you want to go red. Mitch, you and I were sitting down the other day and uh, just taste testing a little bit. For the wine lovers out there, the Merlot beer and the KO Punch, I am telling you, exquisite at LeBros. Check it out, LeBros.com. KO Punch, a little uh, little dangerous. You you enjoyed the KO Punch. As In a, a good boxer, way. As a boxer. I think you enjoyed the KO punch. <laughs> it was it was it was pretty good. Uh, check it out. Uh, just whatever you want, what kind of flavor, uh, what kind of palate, and and they'll have that discussion. You can go and taste test just a couple. Just check in. They'll let you see what you like. Their taps are open. The tap room is not open. We understand that. We are there. Once that tap room opens, by the way, we will finally have that post game pints launch party, which we want to invite you to. And t let me tell you this. We mentioned it before, Mitch, there is something special brewing between the Post Game Pints podcast and LaBras uh, Le Brewing. <laughs> All right. What Blonde. do you want to do next? Blonde. James Blonde. You want to do a classic sports argument? Sure. Let's do it. All right. Mitch, what's yes. the best sports video game in the world? NHL 94. NHL 94. Okay, the argument's done. Why don't we have this argument then? What is the second best, second best sports video game ever? And I need you to get involved in comments. I need you to get involved. Tweet directly to Mitch Y. Gallo, Sean R. Campbell. The second best video game of all time. Sports video game. Who's going first? Go ahead. I got, I got answers up the yin-yang on this one. All right, you get one. My answer is going to be right anyways. All right. Answer John? up the yin-yang podcast. Name that podcast. I am going with Punch Out. Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Here's a classic. I know you love it. We are talking 
we are talking that this game was released 30 years ago, and it's still popular today. In fact, this game helped push Mike Tyson's legacy into a different stratosphere when it came out because this is before he exploded onto the scene. Yeah, he was known as the young knockout kid. Punch out came out, and all of a sudden, everybody's talking about the guy in the video game. I know he later had to be taken out of the video game. You don't have to get on that right now. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the uh, NES version, the Super Nintendo version, which Super Punch-Out, Mike Tyson was not involved. And they had the, uh, the two Russian brothers that you had to beat at the end of the game. It was you had to beat one brother, and then you had to beat the other brother. And uh, it, was, it, it was too good that they just transitioned right out of Mike Tyson on that one. The uh, replayability is there, which is huge when it comes to how good a game is. You can play multiplayer, which is obviously a big thing. You hear the sounds from that game. As soon as you hear the sounds, it yeah. immediately brings you back to a certain time. You have the fact that The Simpsons made an episode, basically, with a mock version of uh, Mike, Ty Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Uh, it is a classic, Sean. I love to play it. You know I'm such a video game guy, so I could, I could like you, have mentioned so many different ones. But man, oh man, when you're making a list, Punch Out has to be near the top. And I, you know what I love is that, look, we both went NHL 94. That's a Super Nintendo game or a Sega Genesis game. I know you could play it online. I know that even NHL 221 uh, has brought it back as a retro version. You could play with new players in that old game. That I get it. But Mike Tyson's Punch Out was a Nintendo game, and it still has that long lasting effect. And I think that it does cut through barriers a little bit. It's still a little too pixelated and old school for maybe the kids today. But at the same time, uh, Mike Tyson's punch out, I am with you. That is absolutely in the conversation. But I'm going to go with a different game. But I'm also going to go back to the, to, the, to the days of Nintendo. Not Super Nintendo, not Sega Genesis. I am going to Baseball Stars. And if anybody's played Baseball Stars, they know on that Nintendo game, they were way ahead of the curve when it comes to building your own roster. Now, it wasn't, uh, you know, MLB Baseball where you had the rights to the Montreal Expos or you just had the rights to the players, but you didn't have the rights to the team names. Or you had the rights to the team names, you didn't have the rights to the players. You didn't have to deal with any of that. It was just a straightforward baseball game. But you were able to make your own team, and then every game you won, you won money. And then you built your own team. You were able to name your players, play against teams. If you lost, you won less, you won less money. If you won, and you were able to squeeze out a victory against the American Dreams, the lovely ladies, the Ninja Black Sox. Yeah, I am flashing back to this game right now. You play a schedule, and you build your teams. You'd have your power hitter. You'd give them a little more power, on, and, and you'd buy – that he would be able to hit the ball better and you'd build your lineup. You were never able to do that in a game like Nintendo. Now, the reason why I say baseball starts, it is what created the rest of the great baseball games. You could play MLB The Show 2021, but the, the genesis, the, the, the where it began was baseball stars on Nintendo. For me, the second best sports video game baseball stars and if you haven't played it you've got to go back in time and realize that every baseball game that you played from ken griffey jr rbi the show it all stems from that one game absolutely i'm going with baseball stars the only Second best video game of all time i uh, i love the uh, baseball stars sean I'll tell you the one thing about that game is when you started man oh man it was tough Oh, yeah. If you didn't have much. And, and I will tell you to this day, we play on the same baseball team, okay? And our manager, Adam, he plays shortstop. And every now and then, he, there's a line drive, and he jumps up, and he catches the ball. He looks over at me, and he goes, A jump, because that's what you had to do. If the ball was ahead of you, you'd jump up and hit A, up and A, and you would be A jump, and you would catch the ball. And ever, ever, every single time that he ever did that, he was like, A jump, and that came from baseball stars. I got baseball stars. Mitch Gallo's got Mike Tyson's punch out, punch out on Nintendo. We're both going old school Nintendo games. What is the second best sports video game of all time? Comment below. Check it out on YouTube. Comment directly on Twitter. 
Sean R. Campbell, Mitch Weigel. Just a quick shout out, Mitch. Yeah. To another game. Because another. this is a game that that back in the day was good and is still good today if it is on any console. All right. By the way, I just want Mario, to... I just have to throw this out. Mario Kart. Mario Kart's got to still be in there because it's still amazing today and it was amazing back then. I'll tell you, it's, uh, it, I always found it funny that uh, in Punch-Out, Super Mario was the referee for some reason. All right. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go with uh, WWF No Mercy. Uh, yes, yes. I, I always like WWF Royal Rumble on Super Nintendo, but No Mercy was a better game. No Mercy is the best wrestling game of all time. I'm not, I'm not debating it. I'm yeah. not. I am not at all. Fantastic game. All right. Uh, you ready for a pop quiz, Mitch Gallo? Let's do it. All right. You gave me five names to find. I'm going to give you five names to find in this one. Uh, you can uh, yell at your podcast and do whatever you want or comment below if you know more answers than Mitch Gallo. Your category today is top five seasons by a 40-plus-year-old in the NHL since the year 2000. So someone that was over 40, the, bo the top point season by that player. Did that even make sense? I think so. <laughs> Wait, did that even make sense there? Uh, the Best most point seasons by a player over 40 since 2000. Yeah. yeah, most points by a player that was 40 or over since 2000. I want the top five. I think you'll get three out of five. I think you might miss two. Yeah. All yeah. right. Uh, Yarmar Yager. Yager is uh, number uh, three on this list. Uh, by the way, Yager, he has two seasons over 60 points, over 40 years old, but I'm going to count his 66-point season in 2016 as a 43-year-old. Joe Thornton. Nope. Hmm. Chris Chelios. Nope. Just because he was old doesn't mean he was good. I, I realize that. Uh, Patrick Marlowe. Nope. All these players got over 60 points as a 40-year-old. All of them. 60 all points as a 40-year-old. Yeah, 60. They all got 60. One is a little bit old school. One's middle school. And uh, you got Yager. Uh, but one, the number one answer I think you should be able to get, it was one of those answers just a couple episodes ago that I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Dave Anderchuk. No, not Dave Anderchuk. Uh... I'll give you the years to help you out. Uh, one was 2001. So you got to think of a four, who was 40 in 2001. Kind of went through the 80s and the 90s. Uh, Mario? It was a Mario. Uh, and then the number one answer was in 2011. And he put up 80 points as a 40-year-old. He's a special player. And he's the player that we mentioned a couple uh, podcasts ago. He was in a pop quiz just a couple uh, episodes ago. Mm. Um, and there's one defenseman and there's one defenseman yeah 60 points is for, as a 40 year old one defenseman Paul, Paul Coffey no mm. he was better than Paul Coffey according to me that's yes. a clue that's a clue right there Larry Robinson no since 2000 since 2000 Oh, yeah. See, that, that might give it to you right now. Come on. Who do I think is one of the best defensemen of all time? Vladimir Malkov. Great answer, but you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Vladimir Malkov was not the greatest defenseman of all time. He was the greatest hockey player of all time when he tried. <laughs> I will um, stay. Uh, yeah, two, 2001. Yeah, 2001. Yeah. Huge player. You, you know the name. You just have to realize that he was playing 2001 and he picked up 67 points. He's good for give two the, on this can, can you give me the teams that they played on? Oh. <sighs> All right. The, uh, the old guy was with the Rangers. With the Rangers. Uh... So I'm, I'm, he, he's, he's one of the top scorers of all time, like Yager. He's right there. That's a, that's, that's a clue that i got to give you. Rangers. That's Keith. 
The other guy? Gordie Howe. The other guy, since 2000. Mark Messier. There you go. Okay, Mark Messier. He had 67 points in 2001. Number one answer, uh, he's one of the greatest players of all time. And we just, we always kind of forget about him because he played in different markets. Mark Recchi? Uh, Mark Recchi is number five, but that's not the guy I'm talking about. Good for you. You got Mark Recchi. Uh, so you're missing the defenseman and number one. You got Messi, Yager, and Recchi. Recchi Which team did the defenseman play on? Uh, I can't. If I tell you, you'll get it. It's one team. If I tell you the team, you'll get it. I'm sorry. That, one team? Yeah. If I, tell you, if I tell you the team, you'll get it right away. That's a clue. Ray Borg? Are, no. And, and the other clue is, I think he's one of the greatest defensemen of all time. That doesn't help me that much. Eh, when you get the answer, you're going to be like, oh, I'm an idiot. That's writing that down. Oh, I'm an idiot. Name that podcast. Uh, you want to know the number one and number four answer? I, yeah. I feel number one, Timo, 80 points. Timo, Mark Messier, Guillermo Jagger. Number five is Mark Recchi. Come on. Detroit Red Wings. Nick Lidstrom. Yeah, Nick Lidstrom. 62 points in 2011 as a 40 year old, as a oh, defense. Shoot. Campbell. Yeah, yeah, but here's the thing when Lidstrom was 40, he looked like he was 30. He's still that's, – that's one of the reasons why. Yeah, I, I believe you won the Vez, uh, not the Vezna, the Norris. Thank you, Blonde, James Blonde. Thank you, LeBros. At, uh, check him out at LeBros.com. All right, Mitch, it's time to name that podcast. I wrote a lot of things down. Uh, let's see. Oh, I can't even read what I wrote. What do you, you got? You know what? I'm going to go with I'm an idiot. <laughs> I, I want to go with – to be the man, you got to beat the man. Woo! <laughs> you know what? We could also go with uh, Blonde, James Blonde. That's, that's, a, that's a very good one. I like that one, too. I also like uh, Punch-Out versus Baseball Stars. Not bad. Not bad. All right, Dave, you get to decide to name that podcast. That's it for us on Episode 5. And don't forget... If you go back and you tell them what number I was wearing in episode four at LaBras, you get a discount on your beer. Cause I'm going to go there pretty soon because maybe I'm out of my blonde, James blonde. Cheers. Thanks for listening.